All right, our penultimate speakers are Selvi Kadirvel and Pavel. Pavel is uh, out sick, unfortunately, so he'll be um, on on the recorded call. Uh, they're going to tell us what we are missing in our GitOps pipeline. Thanks, Selvi. Thank you, Madhuri. Okay, I'll wait for the slides to come up. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for choosing to be here. Uh, I'm Selvi Kadarwell, and I'm from Elotl. Uh, Pavel, as Madri mentioned, is going to be watching the live stream. Uh, thank you, Pavel, and he's going to give us an awesome uh, recorded demo. Uh, and most importantly, Team Elotl, uh, it's their work that made the stock possible, so... <laughs> okay. So, uh, I know you've heard a lot of GitOps today, so we're going to start with a little bit of trivia. I love trivia about software projects. So, the term uh, originated from uh, WeWorks. So, they had a push to production uh, back in 2019, which caused the entire production cluster to fail. And in about 40 minutes, they were able to bring up all their uh, components back up. And during the post-mortem post analysis, they said, We've got, we're doing something right. This worked out really well. All of the manifests were in uh, Git, and they had all of the core principles uh, kind of defined at that point in time. Uh, their CEO, Alex Richardson, called it GitOps. He shared it with a friend who told him it was a really ugly word. And he said, perfect, people will remember it. And so he, that's what we uh, keep hearing of GitOps. So even though some of you might be familiar, we're still going to do a little bit of an intro. So we're all on the same page, so bear with me. Uh, we've chosen our GitOps tool of choice to be Argo CD. So we'll do a little bit of basics. And then we'll talk about why organizations need to be scaling their Kubernetes environments and how this leads to the need for the missing piece we'll describe. Uh, we'll do a little demo and we'll tell you how you can uh, try everything out. So um, GitOps can be defined as an operating model for deploying your applications to Kubernetes environments. Uh, its core principles include a declarative desired state of system. This simply means that you want to uh, describe your system as a set of facts and not as a set of instructions. Uh, you want it to be versioned within a single source of truth, which will be your Git repo. Uh, this all seems pretty obvious in Kubernetes environments. We do have declarative manifests, and we are you know, uh, checking them into our Git repos. Uh, but the key core piece is a pull model of deployment. Uh, this means that instead of your CI CD pipeline pushing your manifests into your Kubernetes clusters, you want your GitOps engine or your controller to be pulling manifests uh, from the Git repo. Uh, and you want it to be continually reconciled, which means if there's a user error or a, in your environment, you want this to be automatically reconciled and go, eventually <clears throat> go to the desired state of the system. So these are the core principles. Um, within, uh, we've chosen Argo CD, uh, and a core uh, concept or construct within this is the application CRD. This is an Argo construct. Uh, it specifies three main aspects. One is where is my single source of truth? Uh, so you'll have, oh, sorry. Okay, let me go back. Okay. Okay, so your single source of truth is where is my Git repo? You want to be able to specify that. There are a lot more uh, qualifiers to this. I'm just keeping it simple here. And then you want to know where is my deployment environment, which is your Kubernetes clusters API server. And you have multiple control knobs for reconciliation. Here, for example, is an automated sync policy, uh, which says that uh, as soon as a Git PR is pushed, you want it to be automatically um, uh, deployed into your environment uh, through a periodic poll which can be whose time interval can be defined. Now, okay. So in everyone's Kubernetes journey, we start with one single Kubernetes cluster, and soon it's just not sufficient. At the very least, you have a dev cluster, a QA cluster, a staging, and a prod cluster. Uh, soon uh, your application becomes really important. You want to make sure it's geographically distributed for either performance needs or latency needs or just for the purpose of failure domains. And you know, once your application is, uh, cannot be developed by a single team, you have different tier teams building different microservices that need to interoperate together. Once again, there is a need for multiple Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and if you're in a large organization, each of business units develop completely independent products, and you have a bunch of Kubernetes clusters come up. I've been in teams where you know, we've had a Kubernetes cluster brought up for every single PR because we were developing Kubernetes tools that needed to be on a green field deployment. I've also been in teams where the entire team shared a single cluster, and we were all isolated by namespaces. 
this. So I'm really curious, you know, what part of the Kubernetes journey you're in. If you have between, say, zero to five clusters, you know, could you raise your hands? Okay, awesome, zero to five. Uh, five to 20 clusters? Okay, a few of you, three or four people. And 20 to 50 clusters, anyone? Not yet? Zero to five, okay, cool. More than 50? Awesome. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> so, we're, <laughs> so we're all definitely going to be getting there soon. So, okay. Okay, so how do we scale to multiple clusters within Argo CD? Uh, very obviously, you'll have to have a separate application CRD for each workload and each uh, map to each Kubernetes cluster. Seems pretty simple. Seems like that would work for a handful of clusters. But what if you have uh, you know, more than a handful of clusters? Uh, Argo CD does make it easy for us to be able to do that through a concept called application set. Uh, this is a templating mechanism using which uh, app CRDs are created automatically through what is called as a generator. There are you know, multiple generators. The ones that's relevant to this use case is the list generator and a, a cluster generator. In a list, like sh in this example shown here, you typically list your set of clusters, and these, uh, the templating mechanism will create the app CRDs for each of the different um, target clusters. In the case of the cluster generator, uh, internally, Argo stores its clusters as secrets with uh, configuration on how to access that cluster. That can also be used as input to the templating uh, mechanism. So yes, it seems like it will work for a number of clusters, but the missing piece here is not that exactly the missing piece. The kind of limitation here is that the mapping between your workload, sorry, that's not very easy to read. I've written mapping between the workload to your cluster is static, which means that you, it's, it works for deterministic use cases, but there are a number of use cases where you want to be able to use the cluster's current status to determine where your workloads will be placed. Let's look at some use cases. First, for example, my team has three dev clusters, and I have a workload that I want to be placed in any one of them as long as it has sufficient resources. A second use case, let's say I'm running a training ML workload, and because of some changes in data source, I want to increase the number of rep replicas in my deployment for 10 to 30. I want to say, hey, if the current workload that's running on won't work well, can you please seamlessly migrate my workload to another? I want to be able to say this to my deployment environment. Secondly, another third use case is, say I'm ready to push my code from a staging to prod, and I want to say, place this workload uh, in all of our AWS regions in the US, except the US West region, because it so happens that that's our you know, uh, uh, highly loaded region, and we usually do that a few days after our first uh, uh, push to prod. So in order to address use cases like this in this category, we believe the missing piece is a multi-cluster orchestrator. Let's look at what this is and uh, how it can help. Okay, a multi-cluster orchestrator refers to a group of Kubernetes clusters whose workloads is being managed and orchestrated by a top-level control plane or a management cluster. Now, we, this is a, you know up-and-coming area of uh, Kubernetes tools. Uh, some of the available solutions are Red Hat's Open Cluster Manager, uh, Elotl's Nova product, uh, KCP, another project from Red Hat, it's transparent multi-cluster. Huawei Technologies has a product called Karmada. So these are multi-cluster orchestrators. You might ask, how is this different from a typical Kubernetes management plane that lets me view and access a, a multiple clusters? The key difference is that a Kubernetes management plane allows for cluster lifecycle management, which means your day zero to day n operations of provisioning, co configuring, and maintaining your clusters over its lifetime. And a cluster orchestrator provides a service at a higher level of abstraction. It says your clusters are available and there, now how do I place my workloads? That's the question it's helping you answer. Okay, so within, let's go deeper into a multi-cluster or orchestrator. Uh, one of the key concepts is a schedule policy. These are called differently. Uh, Open Cluster Manager calls it the placement policy. Uh, Karmada calls it the propagation policy. In a sense, they're all trying to uh, address the same user need. So it answers two important questions. Which resources does this policy govern? And which is the subset of clusters in my environment that I want this policy to consider? And how do you define uh, the resources? So you can choose labels. 
So your re all your uh, re uh, Kubernetes objects that have, say, the app, Nginx, key value pair need to be addressed by this policy. Or you can say all the resources within, say, some namespace, uh, XYZ, need to be placed by this policy. Then which clusters do I need to consider? So you can talk, once again, labels provide a flexible mechanism to do this. So in the first use case that I talked about, you could say env dev refers to all my dev clusters, choose one of them. Uh, similarly, you also can list, uh, provide inclusion and exclusion lists. So in my third use case, it would be uh, that I talked about, it would say, hey, place it in all of my US East and other regions except for my West region. So you can provide include exclude lists. So this is a simplified uh, uh, a rendering of the schedule policy CRD. It just talks about you know which resources, which clusters, and you can use uh, you know a range of combinations of these to define what your policy is. Okay, so how do we integrate? Argo with a multi-cluster orchestrator. Uh, this depends on the design choices made by each orchestrator. We'll show you an example with Nova. Uh, in this case, there's simply two different things. There's just two different things you need to do. One, within the Argo application CRD, instead of providing the direct Kubernetes cluster where you want your workload to be scheduled, you would provide the, no uh, the control plane of your orchestrator. Uh, its API endpoint will accept workloads and make uh, placement decisions based on the schedule policy. And then in addition to that, you will have a bunch of manifests, which are your schedule policies, which will do the dynamic mapping. We'll look at some examples of that in the demo. Okay, so we're just going to go over the same use cases. I'm going to talk about in yellow the actual feature that enables this use case from an orchestrator. So in this case, we talk what we care about is resource availability. So capacity-based scheduling would be the feature in your orchestrator that would allow this type of placement. Uh, in the case of a place where I wanted to intelligent, intelligently move my workloads, it would be workload migration the feature of your orchestrator. And finally, in this, uh, this is the cluster inclusion and ex exclusion methodology, wherein you would uh, specify, hey, place it in all regions except you know, a couple of regions. OK. Uh, before we watch the demo, let's uh, gi give you a quick outline about it so you'll know what you're watching. Uh, we will have an Argo deployment and a cluster orchestrator. Uh, it will be running on a combination of uh, Google GKE Cloud as well as uh, on-prem clusters, so we're just taking kind clusters to keep it simple. We'll show you where the integration point between the two is. Uh, we'll show you how a schedule policy looks like and how, we, uh, how different configurations of the resource and cluster selector work together. Uh, there's a couple of concepts that I'll go into before the de uh, demo, which is group scheduling. So we, we've been talking about Kubernetes resources, but typically a group of Kubernetes resources is what makes an application. How do we specify these resources are related, and I want to place them in the same cluster? There's a couple of ways orchestrators do that, uh, either through labels or a separate CRD. Um, so... Uh, in the case of Nova, we use labels, and internally, Nova automatically creates a schedule group that puts together resources. Uh, manifest work is an example through Red Hat's OCA Open Cluster Manager, where you would, a manifest work is a new CRD, which is a, just a combination of all your other uh, resources to be grouped together and placed together on the same cluster. So even workload migration needs to check if all of those resources will be uh, possible to be uh, uh, hosted in a new cluster. Uh, then there's another concept called spread scheduling. Uh, this provides an extra uh, kind of uh, uh, control knob to, uh, for slightly different use cases. So, for example, if you want the same Kubernetes resources, not on any one of your subset of clusters, but on all your subset of clusters, for example, a namespace. Uh, before you send your Nginx apps, you expect certain namespaces. You can use the spread scheduling policy. Uh, and similarly, there's another aspect of spread, which is a single Kubernetes resource can be split across clusters. Say if you had a deployment with 100 uh, replicas, but you wanted to split it as a 25, 75%, uh, you could use this policy to uh, place your workloads. Okay. Hey, Shepard, can we start the video now? Hello, Rejects. It's Pavel Bojanowski from Inotl here. Uh, I'm going to demo how can you leverage multi-cluster orchestrator with Argo CD. Uh, so in this short demo, I will show how platform team can upgrade cluster versions in a way that is invisible to application developers and reliable at the same time, because we'll test if everything works on the 
newer Kubernetes clusters first. Uh, so let's talk about the setup we have here. Uh, so our assumption in this, in this demo is that we have two personas, the platform engineer and application developer. So application developer has uh, the guestbook application and the application itself, uh, application itself only points to the, to the Nova control plane, right? Uh, and it's platform team responsibility to ensure that the application runs um, and for, for high av availability, platform team wants to spread this application onto two clusters. Uh, so as, as you could see, we only have Nova cluster connected to the Argo CD, uh, but the platform team has access to the Nova control plane. And in the Nova control plane, we have four workloads clusters connected. So we have some clusters in the cloud, some clusters uh, locally, and we have two clusters with 1.21 and two clusters that we just connected with 1.25. They don't run anything yet, uh, but we want to test our guestbook app, which currently runs on those two clusters. So we want to test it in one of these cluster first and if it works uh, we'll be m moving gradually to the new clusters uh, while sunsetting the, the old clusters um, so that's that's the demo scenario right right here uh, yeah so as i mentioned the guestbook application is currently spread across to uh, vpoint v1.21 clusters so how platform team did that well they uh, they defined schedule policy in the nova control plane and in that policy they said in the namespace guestbook uh, please select all the kubernetes resources which has this label set group them by version so I currently have only guestbook version one, so all the resources will be in the one group and uh, schedule them to the clusters which uh, match this expression. So to the clusters which has version 1.21 and to the clusters that the platform team didn't label as clusters under maintenance. So if we get back to the, to the console here, and if we describe our clusters, you could see that each cluster object has a set of labels, uh, like version, uh, and it could be any custom labels that, that you can use in, in the cluster selector here. Uh, yeah, there's one more thing. So the platform team decided to spread uh, this group across two clusters. Uh, so they said, please spread it. Uh, across those two clusters and use the, the name as a topology key, meaning that 50% will of, of the replicas will run in, in, in one cluster and 50% will run in, in the second cluster. Uh, so right now the platform team uh, wants to create a copy of the same, uh, of the same application and they want to run it in one of the newly connected clusters with higher Kubernetes version, just to ensure that uh, all APIs uh, are working and, and basically that there were, were no breaking changes in the Kubernetes itself. So the platform team prepared uh, this new schedule policy and in the new schedule policy, they said uh, from the new namespace, which is named guestbook test, uh, select all the resources, and this time schedule them only to one cluster, and that cluster has to be version 1.25. So I will go ahead and sync that policy uh, that platform team prepared. And they also prepared the, uh, the guestbook app copy, basically, uh, so the, the copy itself uh, has the has the labels, so it will be 
matched with, with the schedule policy that we just synced. Uh, if we now sync the, uh, the, the guestbook test app, well, we should see in the events for, uh, for that app that the test guestbook schedule policy was matched and that the objects were grouped and they should land in the in one of the newly connected clusters uh, so if you go here and and check the live manifest there should be uh, there should be cluster annotation added saying that uh, it it will be running in one of the new cluster so just let's just wait a bit until it's all synced uh, okay it says that it runs in in one of the uh, in one of the target clusters uh, I can verify it also in the console so thank you, if, thank you. that's pretty I'm good we can stop the video. Okay, so yeah, we just want to show that uh, the schedule policies were changed, the workloads uh, were targeted to the right cluster, and you'll see evidence of that. Nova context, I can do like. Yeah, okay, super. We can uh, stop the, the video now. Yes, book. And go back to the slides. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So, uh, so we did see that. Um, the workloads were placed on a different cluster depending on the schedule policy constraints and we could uh, verify that uh, new labels were added to the cluster and ensure that it uh, work out. Okay. So uh, one thing that I wanted to add was our multi-cluster orchestra is just a missing piece. No, they're not. They can be used independently if you have a group of clusters to manage your workloads. Uh, in addition, one of the, you know, in addition to policy-based scheduling, you know, migration of your workloads and spread scheduling, uh, we also have uh, certain uh, specific features where a workload can trigger provisioning of a new cluster. We refer to this as a just-in-time cluster. Uh, if that's something that's interesting to you, please attend and Holler's lightning talk at the uh, end of the day today. Okay, so in summary, uh, GitOps strategies are quite powerful for uh, deploying Kubernetes applications. You can augment its power through uh, multi-cluster orchestrators, and the key benefit is the ability to dynamically map your workload to your clusters. You're also able to tra track your cl current cluster's uh, resource availability and make <clears throat> more intelligent placement decisions. Uh, in addition, that this allows you to migrate workloads across your uh, fleet of clusters. Okay. Uh, happy to take any questions, and if you're interested in trying it out, uh, yeah, these are your links. Have you tried attaching more than four clusters to Argo? Was, there's been a conversation on the Argo Slack that it probably doesn't scale itself beyond maybe sort of 10, 20 clusters. Okay. I had a customer that wanted to run 15,000. Um, no, there's some alternatives where... You, that Codefresh have where it's agent based. Mm -hmm. But um, what have you seen? There's a gentleman just across from me that said he had 50 as well. Okay, so the advantage is that to Argo CD, we're connecting just one cluster, the multi cluster orchestrators API server. This orchestrator is aware of the workload cluster. Its duty is to manage your fleet for you, while Argo is only talking to a single point here. So there's no scaling of Argo involved here. It's the orchestrator that does that's uh, uh, that so your does fleet management. Is a single point of failure instead, and the bottleneck. <laughs> uh, high availability is something that we're designing for yeah. uh, because it, it in itself is a Kubernetes application. A lot of the principles that the Kubernetes uh, environment gives us, we leverage. One thing I was just wondering about is what what are your developers putting in the Helm charts that they're providing? Because if you put a a deployment there. Mm -hmm. Nginx, and that was in your chart, and then it was applied to this Nova. Mm -hmm. Is Nova going to try and run that? Was Nova a fake API server that proxies that on? Could you say that again? So what happens yeah. to your Helm resources? So uh, let's say you have a Helm chart. Okay. You checked it into Argo, mm -hmm. and it's going to just run Nginx as a pod. Okay. When you put that in a normal cluster, it will actually start the pod. Mm -hmm. You have this Nova control plane. Uh-huh. Is that an actual Kubernetes API, or is it a fake API that receives it and then proxies it on to another? 
uh, it is a real API server, but it does not schedule it on itself. It, schedule, it finds the right workload cluster and just passes on the API, uh, passes on its workloads to that. So you can use the native Kubernetes objects, because the early work for this, the federated deployment yes. object. Yes, KubeFed, and uh, yes, this is very similar. Yeah. But, but, no, no. But, but with the native objects. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You don't need to have any, uh, yes, it's 100% uh, Kubernetes API conformance. Is this uh, your commercial product, or is this a, what's the license for it? Uh, we have a free trial mode where you can manage a limited number of clusters, okay. but if you wanted to do large clusters, it would be the enterprise version. Cool. All right, so, thanks. To five clusters are free. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Optimization. And I guess my, my question is, you know, the developer, they're not going to be concerned with this, I would say, or not. And, but at the same time, for the operations people, how could this be used to save costs, like cloud cost, or maybe it's not relevant? Right. Cloud cost could be a factor, right? Uh, you know, all that the developer wants is, you know, find me a place that where it works. It's the platform team can define a policy that says, hey, give preference to our, uh, you know, on-prem clusters. And if, it, if that doesn't work out, then choose your, uh, you know, our cloud uh, clusters. So it could, yes. Is it possible to mod automate that, though, that process? Uh, it would have to be defined by someone, to, you know, because it's a kind of what is higher priority to you. You know, it would have to be uh, modeled in the policy. Yeah, and uh, if you attend Ant's just-in-time cluster talk later today, uh, you needn't even have an always-on control plane. Um, so that's also cost savings and additional cost savings as well. Yeah, so you don't have to all have always-on fleet of clusters. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, so you mentioned that you push the workloads to Nova, and then Nova decides which cluster to schedule it to. Uh -huh. So how is Nova then scheduling the workloads on that cluster? Is it using Argo as a mechanism for how it pushes to that cluster? It is a push mechanism. It's not a pull mechanism. The workload clusters don't. Uh, the agents do pull from uh, this one, but it's not, you know, comp it's not GitOps. You're not using any GitOps tools. Mm -hmm. But the agents are pulling from the uh, Nova control plate. Gotcha. Okay. Good Thank question. You. Thank you. <laughs> A little bit of inception. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks so much, Selvi and Pavel. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>